Okay. Uh, good evening. Thank you very much for coming. This crowd looks like a family reunion. Some of the people maybe didn't see each other for quite some time. So it's like a lot of very interesting meetings and uh, really emotional, emotional things. Uh, my name is Regina Hidekel. So Hidekel is uh, from the Bible. Yes, it's right. one of the rivers, one of four. Two of them, Ephrat and Tigris. Tigris was renamed by Greeks, so we are Tigris as well. Okay, so, and I'm very pleased to organize this event for my very, very dear uh, friend, uh, Michael Skaken, who is uh, one of our first American friends after we came here from the Soviet Union in the beginning of the 90s. And he was very helpful with introducing us with friends and uh, colleagues and, uh, you know, uh, different institutions and so on. And since that, for 30 years, we are still, you know, friends, which is not so unusual, yes. <laughs> so, um, and uh, also the uh, book that he translated is very interesting. I would love to read once because uh, part of our family uh, came also from uh, the same region, would say, from Vitebsk. Uh, it's uh, my husband's family, because I came, like you, <laughs> from Kamenitz Podolsk. It's very close to, to Praskurov. Yeah, there was this terrible pogrom. It's, I know from my childhood about this. And um, I lived later in Chernovtsi, which is a center of also Jewish culture which is an absolutely incredible city. But my father-in-law, Lazar Hidekel, he uh, was born in Vitebsk, and he uh, was uh, uh, attending an art school which was founded by Mark Chagall mm -hmm. in 1918. So he was a student of Chagall, of Malevich, and Lisitsky. And uh, after he became a famous artist and also visionary architect. So he created futuristic cities. And uh, you know, it's very also, I think, uh, interesting and special for this, for people who are uh, coming from these shtetls to become like, you know, like modernist and uh, futurists in architecture. Mm -hmm. So he is like, you know, created philosophical and uh, stylistic uh, uh, futurism. So, um, Jewish uh, futurism, I would say. Uh, so, um, uh, what I would say a few words that um, Lazar Hidekel, as well as Chagall, who we actually met in 73 when he came from uh, Paris, from France to uh, Leningrad, uh, none of them wanted to visit Vitebsk after the war because Vitebsk was totally destroyed. It was a different city. A Jew, a, no one Jewish person survived in Vitebsk. No one. Even uh, they killed the children from mixed marriages. It's just unbelievable what happened there. And uh, um, the city also was totally destroyed, and especially Jewish neighborhoods. When um, Lazar Hidekel's brother was in Vitebsk in the 50s, in 56, something like that. He even didn't find a place where his house was wow. once, you know, before the war. Well, the only uh, lucky person who was lucky in all his life was Mark Chagall, because his house survived. Yeah. And now there is a museum in his house. It's wow. So nobody wanted to go there. And we also never actually had an idea to go there. But once we were in Leningrad, in St. Petersburg, already in 2017, and we had some you know, spare time. And I said, oh, where we go? Maybe we'll go to see Copenhagen, or maybe better, we'll go to see Vitebsk. And we decided to go to Vitebsk. 
So we took a cameraman because we uh, uh, actually we are doing a lot of exhibitions of Lazar Hidekel. We do did a lot of publications. One of the recent books I just uh, uh, gave to Michael. So um, there are some um, films about him, documentaries. Mm -hmm. So we decided that we need to do maybe some you know, a recording for the new film. So we took him, and when we came uh, to Vitebsk, we were, uh, we just were very happy from the first moment, because uh, we were met by um, people who um, were working on this art that was avant-garde, would say. You know, they were writing books, they were doing research. Um, Chagall House was a museum. There was another cultural center by name of Chagall. The school where, uh, that, you know, which was established by Chagall, which was for 60, 70 years, like, neglected totally and occupied by some whatever it was, was f f finally given to the art community. And they restored this. It, they, it's a beautiful school. And they called this street Chagall Street. Mm -hmm. So it was a lot, a lot of very interesting developments. And we met people who soon organized a, um, a Belarusian Jewish uh, Heritage Center. And together with them, uh, in, till 2020, uh, we uh, organized a number of events. We did exhibition of Lazar Hidekel at the National Art Museum, the main museum of Belarus. Uh, we did the conferences. Uh, we did a, also established our Hidekel Prize for Innovation at the Union of Architects. So we did a lot of stuff. And it was absolutely wonderful. But one day, COVID came in, and Lukashenko, you know, all this turmoil with this fraud election, and uh, after Ukrainian war, and everything stopped. And you know what is interesting that, uh, for example, there were little uh, small periods of freedom in this land. It was after the revolution, like 1718, in Ukraine and in Belarus. In Ukraine, they even had like a new government, and uh, they uh, made Yiddish as a state language, one of state languages. So it was unbelievable, and um, and it soon it was over, and the same was with uh, uh, in Belarus now when we uh, enjoyed so much, like a relatively free world, you know. Even it was a dictatorship, but dictatorship was, you know, on the back. And people were, felt themselves very well. And it's finished. So this is basically my story about this place. Uh, it's a really interesting place. It makes you happy when you're coming there, but it's not for a long time, unfortunately. And now um, I maybe uh, maybe you you know everything about our friend Michael, but I will still read his short bio. So, Michael, he is the author of *On Burning Ground*, a stranger fiction narrative of extreme wartime survival. It's about his father. You, probably you all know. So he is a writer, translator, and memoirist, and public affair consultant. He was born in Jaffa, but uh, resides primarily in the United States. He studied with Alfred Cousin, the late literary critic and writer of the acclaimed memoir, A Walker in the City, as well as Irving Howe, uh, the Yiddish uh, anthologizer <laughs> and author of World of Our Fathers. He was the son, he is the son of Holocaust survivor, survivors, and he grew up speaking fluent, richly idiomatic Yiddish, and most recently translated books that you know. 
Uh, so he also served as editor and columnist for various metropolitan weeklies, including New York Observer, The Forward. He headed the Congress for Jewish Culture um, uh, umbrella of leading Yiddish organizations and organized a number of cultural events, uh, including centennial celebratory issue of Zukunft, the oldest Yiddish journal in the world. As a special consultant to the United States Holocaust Memorial Council, he prepared literary and educational materials for National Remembrance Week, observed in all 50 states. Maybe not all of you know this. It's very interesting. Active as an event <coughs> coordinator in New York, he has helped organize a commemoration in honor of Sir Isaiah Berlin, the Oxford philosopher, Octavio Paz, the Mexican poet and Nobel laureate, as well as milestone commemoration of the Marshall Plan um, and the host of lectures by noted civic, academic, and intellectual figures. At the end, what I want to tell you that I'm doing um, our annual film festival, art film, doing like diaspora festival and art film festival, and we will show like a few pieces that we um, organized together with this um, Belarusian Jewish Heritage Center, which is in exile now, of course, not in Belarus. They live in London, in Paris, in different places. And we will show a few interesting things, including Yiddish, um, 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 I would say, masterpieces. One is the uh, animation of a fair tale which was, uh, um, uh, became a book by Lysitsky, and also a memoir, a, like a polymedia uh, videos, video performance, I would say, uh, um, based on uh, memoirs, also autobiography of Simon, um, of Maimon, uh, who is 18th century <coughs> Yiddish philosopher from the same era. So we'll be happy to see you all there. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. It's a pleasure to see you here. It does, as uh, Regina said, feel like a family reunion, and I'm so glad for that. Mm -hmm. I want to start also to talk a little bit about Belarus in general, but we'll get into the thick of the uh, memoir as soon as I can. So uh, let's start with a, by adopting a wide-angled lens, and then we'll narrow it to a sharper focus. Uh, map makers tell us that the geographic heart of Europe is not France, not Germany, but Dafka, Belarus. <laughs> Who knew? They say that Polotsk, which is an import, was at once an important trading post on the river Dvina, dating back to the Vikings, and it was also an important Jewish uh, town, is smack in the epicenter of the continent. The, Be the Belarusians, as you can imagine, are extremely proud of this, though villages in uh, Lithuania insist that the bragging rights are theirs. Everyone wants to be the heart of Europe. But be that as it may, Belarus has, has historically, by Western historians, been considered a peripheral region. And it, it has gotten really short shrift uh, and dismissed often as an afterthought. Why? Because it was considered a mere geographical expression. It was, a, it was considered an appendage of other nations, first the Tsarist Empire, then the Soviet Union, and today it's even an appendage, you might say, of the Russian Federation. Mm -hmm. And so somehow it got lost in the shuffle. And then entire centuries appear to hang suspended, partly because there is no master narrative. Now we know there is a Jewish master narrative to Belarus, but for many, uh, for many centuries, Belarus was neither here nor there and always in between. And then uh, on this side of the Atlantic, assimilation did the rest. Why? Because Belarus towns and villages approached near oblivion 
They were banished to the back of beyond, the region betwixt and between, swallowed up by poverty and tedium and history, and all too often by outright massacre. It's not surprising that the term bloodlands, which became very popular a number of years ago by the uh, uh, historian uh, Timothy Snyder, s described this area between uh, Germany and uh, Russia, and Belarus is, is, constitutes an important part of that bloodlands, became the term that described it. But for Jews, as um, Regina reminded us, Belarus, whether it's from Brest in the west or Vitebsk in the northeast, once constituted a center of Jewish culture in Europe, and that included top drawer rabbinical academies, first rank literature and journalism, and linguistic hothouses in which the development of both Hebrew and Yiddish could flourish, and even, as Regina reminded us, the flourishing of modern art, as we were told in Vitebsk. So it is unquestionable that an understanding of Jewish life is inseparable from Belarus. Now, to get to, our, to what we're here about, um, for our protagonist, Daniel Charney, who comes from a very tiny, tiny shtetl in the heart of Belarus, 23 miles southeast of the capital, Minsk. No, it was no more than a speck on the map. It was the epicenter of his world, as a birthplace must always be for any, for, in, in anyone's childhood, the place where they were born becomes the center of their universe. In his memoir, he informs us that Ducor consisted of a mere hundred Jewish families. But what a world they comprised, and how well he captured it. Even New York suffers in comparison to Ducor. Imagine that. Ducor was small enough to be comprehended. You know, it, the Italian writer Italo Cal Calvino claimed that great cities like New York and London and Paris were too big to be taken in as a whole. In effect, they become by necessity invisible and thus imaginary cities because they're too large to be taken in, as I say, in one fell swoop. However, Ducor is different. And let me read just a small segment here of um, how he compares uh, uh, Ducor to New York. He says, in comparison with New York, Ducor, my little town, was a lot smaller than even one street in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. I believe that the hundred Jewish families of Ducor could have squeezed into one large apartment house where I now live, and a few rooms would still remain to rent. But some 50 years ago, actually it's 120 years ago for us, when I was still a schoolboy, I imagined that a more beautiful and roomy town than Ducor did not exist in all the world. Truth be told, I can even now claim that my small town of Ducor, in some sense, remains in my own eyes nicer and grander than New York. Mm -hmm. Now, for example, I have been living many years in Brooklyn in quite a large apartment building, but don't ask who my next door neighbors are. Neither do I interest myself in them, nor they with me. I have many friends and relatives in New York. I have more, many more friends and relatives in New York than in Ducor. But who has time in the metropolis for family sentiment and friendly meetings, savoring the simple joy of it? So you can tell that, you know, uh, the smaller the city, the greater the joy. There's an expression in Yiddish, the kladar de simche, the grasser, no, the kladar de oilam, the grasser de simche. Meaning, the smaller the uh, crowd, the smaller the group, the bigger the uh, simche. The, so, it, obviously, he, he met that, uh, he found that in Ducor. And then the people he depicts are a veritable cast of characters. It's a crowded canvas of human types. And he didn't have to look very far to find them because all of his family was either in Ducor or in the nearby Berezin. And, the, and this group of people, his family particularly, provided him enough comedic material to last a lifetime. His uncles and aunts and cousins proved to be a treasure trove. 
perhaps the most outre, the most unusual, were his uncle Feitel the angel and his mad daughter, Basha the Meshugane, the great, the lunatic, two of the strangest people you'll ever, you're ever likely to meet. They're, both of them were made uh, mad by excessive piety. Uncle Feitel was the older brother of Daniel Charney's mother. A, he was himself a cobbler. He possessed a carpentry shop as well, but he was intensely religious. He spent the entire morning praying, wrapped in his prayer shawl and phylacteries, the tefillin that every Jew needs to wear in morning services. He always looked, appeared into holy books, of which he had written one himself. But above all, he was a silent man, a man so holy and otherworldly that he almost never bathed, by the way, and eventually acquired the nickname the angel, the Malach. Daniel Charney writes, quote, even as his servant, I heard him emit only a few discreet words and made out the rest by intuition. In general, he was aureoled by an extraordinary stillness, such an eerie quiet that can throw you into a panic, unquote. Once a year, Erev Yom Kippur, Daniel leads his uncle to the bathhouse, the mikveh, and what a scene that is, at once sublime and ridiculous, more the latter than the former. But Uncle Feitel's daughter, Masha de Mishugane, as she was called in due corps, takes the cake. The imaginings of her fevered brain are incomparable. Let Daniel do the talking here, because once you, um, you hear him describe it, you'll know exactly what he's saying. Let me just begin with a couple of observations that he makes in general. He says, a modern psychologists say that in our day, everyone is at some point and at some place a bit cracked. <laughs> but the psychologists themselves are often all just human beings and are subject to the same distemper. I knew a psychoanalyst in Paris who at home was a real nutcase beating his wife and cursing the Holy Mother, apparently he was not Jewish, and cursing the Holy Mother <laughs> despite going to church every Sunday. His name became known far and wide in part because he would have the temerity, the actual chutzpah, to charge no less than 300 francs for a visit, as if he were Sigmund Freud himself. And he says, uh, there, and he goes on you know, with these kinds of interesting uh, and humorous observations. Now, then he go, gets into the meat of, um, of who Masha, the lunatic, is really. Mm -hmm. All these ideas and notions have come to the tip of my pen because I am about to describe my cousin Masha, the daughter of Uncle Feitel, the angel, whom I have described in the previous chapter. Then, some 50 years ago, or for us, 120 years ago, in due corps, we had no idea of the unconscious and, or the superconscious and had no notion of the sex drive and other impulses which now vex the whole world. We only knew that Ducour must possess its own lunatics, if only to enliven the shtetl life. God has sent along Masha, turned mad because of her lack of a, quote, superconscious, and the presence of a very ample, quote, unconscious. One dark Sabbath Eve, my uncle Feitel, the angel, suddenly took ill. He had to be brought quickly from home to the town's non-Jewish medic. Masha was sent after the medic. A fearsome downpour fell outside in a mist and veil of the shtetl. In front of the Kadar, of Kadar Street, the white stone church stood with its three rounded cupolas reaching to the sky. A tile tore off one of the cupolas and the angry wind kicked it around in the dark night. Masha imagined that witches were dancing on the church's steeple. Somehow she wandered into the church, but quickly exited, screaming at the top of her lungs, Shema Yisrael, hear Israel the land, the Lord our God and the Lord is one. As she ran from the witches, she slipped and fell into the mud in a faint. Passerby brought her home with foam flecked on her lips and eyes glassed over. When Masha came to, she invented a total lie about the non-Jewish medic, that he had raped her. 
just near the church, right in the mud. He had violated her, and the devils danced their wedding round on the church's steeple. From then, the entire shtetl began to speak of Masha, the lunatic. So you can tell the descriptive powers of um, uh, Daniel uh, Charney are really considerable. Now, his description of his own parents were very different. When it came to his mother, he took a wholly different tone, especially because of her yichas, her pedigree. She was a descendant of the Shlo HaKodesh. Who was he? He was Rabbi Isaiah Horowitz, born in 1555 in Prague, and he became one of the most important Jewish scholars of the early modern period. Not only was he the chief rabbi of, of Frankfurt and then of Prague, but his name, Shlo, is derived from a contraction of his greatest work, the Shnei Luchot Habrit, the Two Tablets of the Law which was an encyclopedic compilation of ritual, ethics, and mysticism, which had a tremendous influence on the founder of Hasidism, the Baal Shem Tov. And why is this important for us? Because the Shlaw's connection to Hasidism, after all, he paved the way for the spread of Jewish mysticism. They say, scholars say that after the Shlaw, the Kabbalah was no longer a mere esoterical doctrine of the elect, but actually a foundation of Jewish religious and social practice. And the important thing is that Daniel's father, Zev Wolf himself, was a Lubavitcher Chassid, as were all the inhabitants of Dukor, save for one, of whom later. 120 years ago, the Lubavitcher Hasidim did not command the widespread influence they do today, but they symbolized how far north Hasidism had spread in Eastern Europe. Daniel's father died at the age of 38, when Daniel was hardly more than a year old. The loss was incalculable. It left a gaping hole, which his mother tried to fill, but the absence of his father haunted him. Somehow, Daniel's Hasidic lineage, the pervading presence of Lubavitch in Dukor, served as a kind of parental substitute. And uh, this parental substitute was composed first under the spiritual leadership of the chief rabbi of Dukor, Rav Moshe Karni, Daniel's great uncle. And then, upon his death in 1900, by the long and venerable stewardship of Rabbi Dissen Telushkin, who had married into Rav Charney's family. He had married his oldest daughter, Fruma Sora. Then Rabbi Telushkin, whose uh, grandson is here today himself, <laughs> a, a venerable writer and uh, rabbi, uh, Rabbi well, Dick. Oh, a couple. I'm, yeah. I'm sorry. Ezra. Oh yes, I'm. I'm Ezra. Thank you. Thank you for all. The, uh, and some of his. So Rabbi Telushkin, who arrived in the United States in 1925, became the spiritual leader of Tukor's Jews in Brooklyn until I believe the 1960s. Yes. So, uh, so these two men, and include and the other hundred uh, families of uh, Lubavitcher Hasidim helped become kind of parental or surrogate fathers for the young uh, Daniel Charney and his, and his brothers as well. And the irony here is that uh, this region had always been the center of the Litvaks. You know, the, the Litva uh, uh, in, in history, uh, Belarus for two centuries was part of the Duchy of Lithuania, which, is much, which, was, which then was much larger than Lithuania is today. It was so vast a region that it actually uh, extended as far east as Smolensk, if actually, not mo if actually Moscow itself. And then it was part of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, a monarchy with an elected king, some scholars say that was a forerunner of democracy because there were many, many ethnic groups that were part of the uh, Commonwealth. And the Polish-Lithuanian uh, Commonwealth uh, was comprised of um, Catholics and, and even Protestants and uh, Russian Orthodox. I mean, everyone was part of that. It's different than Poland is today. But the important thing is that this Litvak area 
became the center of the Mithnagdim. Those are people who became the opponents of the Hasidim. And the Litvak's characteristics are interesting. They have a gift for learning and Talmudic exegesis. They have a taste for abstraction and a time for science, a special regard for the autonomy and perception of judgment, and many other characteristics. But the important thing was that they became fierce opponents of Hasidism, which they saw as uh, an expression, an excessive expression of religious, uh, of religious ecstasy. And yet, these Hasidim, even though they were opposed to the Misnagdim in a very, very direct way, they themselves adopted some of the characteristics of Litvaks. For example, um, Chabad, which today is the most internationally oriented of uh, Hasidic sects, and it's widely acknowledged to be the gold standard in Jewish outreach, shows how ingrained Lithuanian Belarusian traits proved to be. Chabad's founder, Rabbi Zalman of Liadi, in his masterpiece, The Tanya, underscored the governing mind as a royal road to mystical union with the divine. Indeed, the very name Chabad, the name of the Lubavitchers, which arose uh, in what is today the easternmost parts of Belarus, is an acronym of the tripartite structure of reason. Chachma, wisdom, Bina, understanding, and Dat, knowledge. In this, in this instance, as in many others, geography can be said to be destiny. So even living in Belarus, which had been the homeland of, of, of the Litvaks, actually had an effect on Hasidism. Now, um, uh, as I mentioned, uh, Daniel Charney informs us that only one Mitnagid, one man who was presumably anti-Hasidic, uh, lived in Dukor. Yet, he describes this man as being profoundly moral, and that he had an, made an indelible impression on his fellow townsmen. This man, he was regarded as with the highest of commendations. He was considered a Lamed Vovnik, one of the 36 holy, righteous, yet undiscovered people on whom the world stands. And he described him in this very warm and, and uh, affect, affectionate way, but ironically, this man was also the father of a, of a young woman, an alluring young woman named Pesha, who gives Daniel his first kiss, a kiss on the forehead to be sure, but she, he's, she starts his whole romantic development. So it's a, it's a, a fascinating story of how the one misnagid becomes the centerpiece of, uh, not a centerpiece of, of the story of Ducor. But the important, I think the central element of this whole story is that Daniel becomes the odd man out. And why is that? Because illness marked everything. He, it marked him as the other. Uh, the overriding motif in the book is a debilitating disease that plagues Daniel from his earliest beginnings. And what did he suffer from? He suffered from scrofula as it was then called. It's a disfiguring illness caused by a type of tuberculosis infection. It disabled him from the outset, and it cast a permanent pall on his young life. In fact, he ended up spending 12 years in sanatorium. So he was, he was disabled from an early age, and it marked him in a very significant way. Let's not forget that his father died of tuberculosis at the age of 38. And Daniel, suffering from a variant of tuberculosis, stayed at home under the constant supervision of his mother, tightening an already very intimate bond that would come to shape his life in ever more fundamental ways. Indeed, she tried to cure him uh, and in whatever way she could. And he writes uh, in, in Ducor, quote, Mother tried curing me with her widow's tears and many blessings. After all, her name was Bracha. Bracha means blessing. She traveled with him to Minsk, to Kiev, and finally to Vilna in search for a medical solution. And she was prone to tears because there's a Yiddish proverb that has it that weeping makes the heart grow lighter. And Bracha had a very heavy heart. She had to bring up 
five, six children without a husband, so it wasn't that it wasn't simple for her, nor was it for Daniel, for that matter. And although Daniel may at times fall into self-pitying dismay at his long drawn out illness, his illness was what we call, or they used to call a fashlepte krank, which means a long drawn, drawn out illness that has no end. Uh, he more often than not summons wit and humor to help to keep despondency at bay. Now, uh, Daniel is really a, na a natural born psychologist and he understood intuitively that disease often intensifies the longing for life, that illness, could summon, that illness itself could summon forth the imagination to restore a world diminished by deprivation. Now, the Dean of American Literary Critics, uh, the late Edmund Wilson, devoted an entire book to this phenomenon entitled The Wound and the Bow an exploration of the origins of artistic genius. He drew on classical Greek mythology, and he drew a parallel between the creative impulse and physical and psychological injury. And he drew on the, uh, the Greek warrior named Philoctetes, who was a notable archer, and who had been bequeathed the bow and arrows of Hercules. This Philoctetes is bitten by a snake and afflicted with an incurable stinking wound that won't heal. After being banished, the injured hero is later sought out by his fellow warriors for his prowess with a magic bow. And his skill is ultimately key to the Greek victory at Troy. Um, in effect, what does uh, Edmund Wilson do here? He is arguing for a poetics of pain. And the unhappy childhood that um, uh, Daniel had, uh, in his case marked and driven by the memory of trauma, would later would result in a mature artistic work. The wound is what gives the archer the energy to reach for the farthest shore of artistic realization. Daniel Charney, smitten by disease at a very early age, is an example of this paradoxical phenomenon. His scrofula, with its ill-smelling medications, deprived him of many of the delights of childhood, yet it set him on a transformative and imaginative course that eventually took him to the heights of literary endeavor. It might not be the only explanation of his achievement, but it must surely be factored into the complex artistic equation. One thing is for sure, sickness can and often does enlarge in the dimensions of the self. Now uh, to, dis to get onto a different topic, uh, or one that's closely related, is the the Genesis of the Memoir. This is a memoir and one of the best known memoirs in Yiddish literature. But it used to be thought that this genre of memoir was alien to the communal orientation of traditional Jewish literature. The memoir emphasizes subjectivity, <clears throat> self-probing, self-examination. It, it seems to be an entirely modern phenomenon that in the, uh, certainly in the medieval age, and certainly even the early modern age, Jews did not write memoirs. They might have written chronicles, but they would never look upon themselves and their own personal experience as the subject of their work. In fact, it was regarded that only those who had weakened or, or had cut their ties or attachment to Jewish tradition commanded the distance and coolness that is necessary to capture the world as an aesthetic phenomenon. But, and the proof of this is that Daniel Charney reads the first pages of his memoir. Where does he read it? He reads it in the bastion of atheistic communist rule, in the office of the Jewish commissar of Shimon Dimenstein, who was appointed by Lenin and who answered to Stalin. It is in this in that chamber that he begins to read the opening uh, lines of his memoir. And uh, so I, this is, in a way, proof positive, you, you could argue, 
that the memoir is, has to, it veers away from the world of tradition, even though it reflects it to a certain degree. Now, it should be noted. Oh, I'm sorry, Michael, what does that mean that he was reading it in that office? Well, what happened, he, the, the, this memoir begins in the opening, the opening chapter is the, um, is the introduction is the, this winter of 1919 to 1920. He's in the office of this commissar, Dimmenstein. Right. And he, Dimmenstein is a very powerful man. He's a commissar. And, the, and he is worried because uh, he wants to hide the, uh, the memoir in a place where the, he's worried the Cheka or, the, or wow. the, the Soviet secret police won't get a hold of it. Mm -hmm. And so the con there's a strong contradiction here because Shimon Dimenstein, who became this big commissar and, and an important figure in, in the Soviet government, had two rabbinic ordinations. He was born in, I believe he was born in Vilna, and he studied in Slobodka and the Lubavitch yeshivas. He received, as I mentioned, he received two rabbinical ordinations, one from the eminent and legendary Rabbi Chaim Ozer Grodzinski, no less. And here he is, a, 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 um, a, a commissar, and even though Charney himself is not as far left as Dimenstein, because Charney never uh, joined the Communist Party, and Dimenstein was also the was uh, he chaired the Central Bureau of the Efsektia, which was the uh, the uh, committee which mercilessly went after Judaism, especially traditional Judaism. The fact of the mat matter is is that um, uh, Chardy uh, was a dedicated socialist that ended up in Moscow in these in these circles, and yet it is in these circles that he reads the beginning of his memoir. Mm -hmm. And uh, let me just uh, mention something here. Um, uh, actually, uh, Dimenstein asks him to read some of the opening lines. Lines, and this is what uh, Charney writes. With a scratchy voice, I then had a cold, I read to him the following two paragraphs. Death's hand brushed me with its black wing while I still lay in the crib. My father's dying sighs ate into the birth pangs of my mother, and my voice is until this very day an echo of these two screams of woe. My mother with her embroidered widow's milk tried with all her strength to drive away my father's grim inheritance, the only one he left me. Comrade Dimenstein's approbative head nods led me to believe that the family chronicle the one that he was writing, impressed him. But as I was then very hoarse, I promised to read the memoir a second time, once the frost broke. Um, uh, so, uh, so it shows you the evolution of um, Daniel Charney from Yeshiva Boy to socialists and then in, in, in the very epicenter of, of the communist revolution. Now, it, it should be mentioned that Shimon Dimenstein, the man with the two uh, rabbinic ordinations, uh, uh, became so involved in, in, in the communist, uh, communist leadership that he actually, in the 30s, lost his life because there was a man who was far more cruel than himself, a man named Lev Mechlis, yeah. who was a vicious Jewish-born commissar who wanted nothing to do with the Jewish community and people, and he was one of Stalin's trust, most trusted deputies. And he betrayed Shimon Dimenstein, who was arrested in February of 1938 and executed six months later. By then, Charney had left um, Nazi-dominated Berlin. First he had left uh, Russia for Paris, and then he went from, or he went, uh, he went to Vilna, and then he eventually went to uh, Berlin, and eventually went to Paris, the relative safety of Paris. And so uh, it's, it's interesting that um, the memoir, though it's, it, it reflects the, um, in many ways, the authenticity of, of the Jewish death of life, is written by a man who no longer has faith himself. And this is something that his older brother understood very well. He had an older brother named Shimon Niger, and Shimon was, in many ways, the dean of Yiddish literary criticism, and of course himself, the son and grandson of fervent Hasidim. 
And uh, actually, Shimon, Shmuel Neger was considered the Ilui of Ducor, the genius of Ducor. Had he not become a literary critic, he probably would have ended up becoming a famous rabbi. But the interesting thing is that Shmuel Neger traced the origins of both Yiddish and Hebrew literature not to the secularizing Haskalah, but to Hasidism itself. And it is not surprising that N Shmuel Neger the, the older brother of um, Daniel found the taproot of modern secular Jewish creativity not in the Jewish Enlightenment of the 19th century, but in the Hasidism born a century earlier. Shmuel Nigger saw his task as a reconciler of tradition and modernity, the individual and the collective. It has been said that he was nostalgic for the integrated religious world of his childhood, the realm of Ducour, and viewed his role as a critic as a type of religious worship. And you can thus say that both brothers realize that religion makes the mind abundant, makes it rich with ideas and images and so on, even as its hold receded. And this is a great paradox of, of literature in many ways. Memory is both the name for the longing and also the name for its transformation. So in the end, to conclude, um, exile and displacement, much like illness, are the great stimuli of the memoir. It is a way to reclaim an often irrecoverable past, irrecoverable in the flesh, but not in the imagination. In Ducor, Daniel Charney saw to and succeeded in recovering the great gift he had lost, Ducor, in the master language of memory, Yiddish. Thank you. There's much more to be said, but uh, uh, if you have any questions, I'd be willing to, yeah. you know, entertain them. Yes. No, my father told me that he remembered once getting a call from Shmuel uh -huh. in which he had just, I don't know if I told you the story, in which Shmuel had just discovered an announcement of Bratislav's Seven Beggars. Uh -huh. And he was so excited, he said, this is such a gem of literature. So, you know, again, so he was uh, very much... <coughs> Impressed by the literary man. Yeah, I mean, so impressed that he really felt that it was, as I said, the Hasidism was really the, the birth of, mm -hmm. of Yiddish and even Hebrew literature, probably because Hasidism was struck the heart mm -hmm. in a way that um, the Misnagdim never could, because you know, lit uh, literature and all the arts deal. I mean, they re they work. They refashion the, the emotions, but without the emotions and the the fervor and the stir, there is there is no yeah. yeah so that's very important, and I think that Shmuel Liger, uh I mean, he paid a, a, a big price for this because one of the uh, Yiddish uh, liter uh, literary cr other literary critics, uh, you know. Uh, dismissed his, this whole idea that Hasidism lays a, lies at the root of it all. Mm -hmm. But uh, the fact is that he was a child of Lubavitcher Hasidim, and, and right. that made all the difference. Yeah. Can you read that last sentence, it, it, two or three sentences from the end, mm -hmm. starts with the word memory. It, it was okay, right after you said... Um, memory, all right. That religion makes the mind abundant. Oh, oh I said, yes, yeah, so both, both brothers realize that relig religion makes the mind abundant, even as its hold on them receded. The, the, the paradox is as religion receded as a factor in their own life, it, it affected their imagination in a tremendous way. And so memory is, um, is the prod, you know, that, that enabled them to become artists. In one case, a uh, poet and, uh, and uh, a memoirist, and in the other case, a... Um, um, you know, a literary critic of the first order. And so, it, you know, it's how you, it's everyone suffers loss, but it's the way of, you, of refashioning loss into artistry. And that's where genius lies, I think. And that's why this memoir is considered, among others, among the, you know, the best of its kind in Yiddish literature.
And how old was he when his father died? He was, some say a year, maybe a little older, but he was, yeah, he, he never knew his father, obviously, from a conscious point of view. But the other people, whether, as we said before, Rabbi Charney, Rabbi Moshe Charney, or Rabbi Nissen uh, Telushkin, helped to create a world for him. I think um, that was very important, because uh, he was fatherless. I mean, today, he would have been a, quote, a basket case, if, if, from a strictly psychological point of view, because he didn't have a father, and uh, he had this terrible illness, and so on, and yet he transcended it through his art, I think, largely. He never had children of his own, but he, uh, but he, had, he married a woman named uh, Kissin, I think it is, I'm not sure, and he adopted, obviously, her children, and he made a life for himself. So, you know, I think art is at the base of it, and it's the art of transcendence and transformation that made it happen. Yes? And so um, Dukor in Belarus was um, 100 families of Hasidim. Yes. Um, is there any, I don't remember anything in the book or anything that I've read that would indicate um, how many other Hasidim were in that general area. Are they unusual for the Well, area? you know, there are, there are quite a few uh, Hasidim in, uh, in, so to speak, in Belarus. There were the Stolen, Karlin Stolen, is one uh, uh, strand. I mean, none were as powerful or as pervasive as the, um, as the Lubavitch. In fact, in the early years of the 19th century, they, they say, I have wrote it down here somewhere, that Nachman of Bratslav actually met Rabbi... Um, Salman of Liadi, and he told him uh, and asked him point blank, is it true what people say that you have 80,000 Hasidim? <laughs> Rabbi, Lia, uh, Rabbi uh, Zalman said nothing, Shneir Zalman said nothing, but already in, in, in the early years of the 19th century, 80,000 was being bandied around, so it, it was a very powerful movement. I don't think any of the other Hasidic movements within Lithuania or Belarus ever reached that, that height or that uh, reach, I should say. Yeah? Uh, the, what, what year approximately did all of the, the brothers leave? Well, uh, so Chuck. Yeah, okay, so uh, um, Daniel was born in 1888 and he passed away in 1959. Uh, he lived almost the longest, even though he was supposedly the, the most ill, which is often what happens in many families. Um, and then um, the oldest, I think, or one of the oldest was Shmuel, Shmuel Nigger, who was born in 1883 and lived to be, I don't know, uh, sometimes in the 60s. He passed away in the 60s. But the, 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 Vladek, the, the, the social activist, uh, who was the head of the forward and was a big um, union representative and was one of the founders of the Jewish Labor Committee, which actively uh, fought for a uh, boycott, a Nazi boycott, uh, during the 1930s. Uh, he died in 1938 at the age of 52. And I heard it said, I don't know how, how true this is, but at his funeral, 500,000 people came. So he was quite a figure in, uh, in Jewish life. The yes, yeah. yes. I mean, when Shmuel Nigger died, I read somewhere that he, a thousand people came <laughs> to the funeral, but 500,000 is amazing. Now, and at that, of course, the governor of New York, uh, LaGuardia, was there, the, you know, the uh, sort of the, cr the creme de la creme of the, um, of the political uh, elite in New York. Was there. So he was quite a figure. Did mm -hmm. they all come to New York? All of them? Yeah. Yes, I, I think that um, uh, uh, Daniel, because of his illness, spent some time in Liberty, New York, in a sanita sanitarium. Mm -hmm. I mean, after all, he spent 12 years there. Right. So his illness, you know, um, marked his life from beginning to end. But he still lived to be about 70, so, yeah. yeah. Question about the core. Our daughter, Shira, who's now uh, 31, <coughs> when she was about 16, they had, from our high school, they did a trip mm. uh, to that area, and she was in Minsk. Minsk was obviously the main city, and they went to a Jewish museum in Minsk. Now, Minsk, unfortunately, is under, you know, still a communist dictatorial rule, mm -hmm. because they went to the Jewish museum there, 
And while they were looking through the museum, they showed her a Torah scroll mm -hmm. that had been recovered after the Holocaust that was damaged, and they said this was recovered from a town called Decor. Wow. And so I realized Ezra at the time, that was obviously a Torah scroll that Saba uh, had, you know, had to have been the Torah scroll that, that he had used when he was the rabbi in Decor. It's amazing that it survived. Yeah, because I mean, Decor has always had the idea of trying get to get go it. there and getting it out. Because yes. But yeah. because of the nature of the government, right. there, I don't think but it maybe there are uh, diplomatic channels, back backdoor mm -hmm. channels. I, I don't know, but that's amazing. Mm -hmm. I know that there are people who are involved in recovering tourists from from Russia, uh, Nizhny Novgorod, and all of these places okay. where so Jews good. had once lived. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it's okay. You can tell me the, the name. I wanted to ask you, what do you think is the overlap? There's so much overlap from Hasidism to communism throughout that whole period, going right up through the 60s, oh. what, what do you think psychologically made so many of the Hasidic families' um, descendants yeah. become communists? Because, well, I mean, it wasn't just Hasidim, I think many Misnagdim also. Mm -hmm. You know, the Misnagdim have this term they call, they call uh, Misnagdim a, a Salem cup which is he, they're, they're a crosshead, that they're so um, analytic that they can think their way into oh. Christianity and into <laughs> socialism and into communism. The powers of, of, uh, of the mind are so sharp that they can go any which way. But I think that uh, even though these, these, uh, these shtetls were, were filled with a lot of strong feelings and emotion, they were, they were very narrow and they didn't offer educational opportunities. Mm -hmm. Also, the industrialization uh, came to Russia late. So uh, these people were going through in the 1890s uh, what, say, was going on in England in the 1820s. You know, they were like 50 or 60 or 70 years behind. And um, many of them didn't become communists, many became Zionists, you know, and, and also didn't want that world. And their Zionism often was, was uh, imprinted by socialism. You know, uh, all of these people, like Ben-Gurion ben was born in Plonsk, you know, he became a socialist Zionist. Uh, many of them turned to other, and of course, socialism in its original purity was a form of secular messianism. Mm -hmm. It was a form of wanting to make a better world mm -hmm. and of uh, wanting to, um, and it had certain moral impulses, you know, the equality of all people. Of course, it was, terribly corrupted and you know people had hoped that socialism would start in England but alas it started in Russia and then went totally haywire in China so uh, but there is a strong element in secular messianism and messianism in general is uh, considered a very dangerous element in Jewish life there's an expression in Yiddish uh, which goes to the effect that we've survived many, many calamities in history, and we'll survive the Messiah too. Because the Messiah originally came to Judaism through Jesus, you know, and then there was Saptai Tzvi, who became a Muslim when the, um, you know, in the, in the 17th century, and there was Jacob Frank. And so when the, I think one of the reasons that the Vilna Goen reacted so badly and refused to meet with Rabbi um, Zalman, and even ratted on him to the to the government, to the Russian authorities, is that he probably saw it as a form of messianism, and you know, and who knows where that would lead. So uh, it was an, uh, you know, they they they, um, they condemned the Hasidim for an excess of fervor, but they had an excess of caution. They misnagged him. Everything was restrained and not to push things, and you know, so yeah. yes. Anything particularly difficult or unusual with translating this memoir for you? Other well, there, there were a lot of um, regionalisms, you know, there's a lot of Belarusian Yiddish in it, uh, which there is no dictionary for. My father, who was born not too far from Dukor, also it would, in what is now northwestern Belarus, would have been a wonderful resource, but alas, he went on to a, a better world. So I, you know, I, I asked around and I, and, well, I had a whole, I didn't, I, I had some reflections about um, translation that I wanted to share with you. And, and one of the things 
uh, uh, that uh, people have said is that translation is basically infidelity. <laughs> because you have to, in a way, to get to the right translation, you have to betray the text a little bit. Because if you do a word-for-word -word translation, it's going to sound clunky, and, and it's good. And so I, uh, and, and the Italians have the best expression for this. They say, uh, let me see, I wrote it down here somewhere, tra uh, traduttore, wait, wait, <laughs> just give me a second. Um, yeah, traduttore, traditore which means the translator is a traitor <laughs> in the end. And he has to be a translator. He has to be because to, to, to do service to the, tra to the original text, you have to play with it. And in playing with it, you inevitably betray it. There is a um, politically incorrect uh, uh, line that's sort of like a quip that is, but I will share it with you anyway. They used to say that translations are like women. If they're beautiful, they're unfaithful. And if they're unfaithful, uh, if they're beautiful, they're unfaithful. And if they're faithful, they're not beautiful. So, you know, which is not true. Which is not true. And it's a terrible thing to say, and it's politically incorrect. But the idea is that if you want a beautiful translation, you need to be unfaithful to a certain degree. And then the, the author will say, well, what's this all about? I didn't write this. But so this is one of, and that's why a lot of people say that translation is an impossible task because um, the closer you come to it, the farther you, you're, you come. And in a way, it's like, it's like the artist. The closer, the farther he comes from religion, the closer he becomes to it artistically, because mm -hmm. he can then start to shape it. And the, the shaping is a kind of betrayal of reality. Mm -hmm. That's why I think Picasso said that um, art is a lie that tells the truth. Yeah. And that you have to lie and you have to shape something in a different form to really tell the underlying truth. And you know, many people say that the greatest works of history of any period is the literature of the period, because that stays. You know, I think, I don't want to quote Ezra Pound, who is, uh, but uh, he once said that what is literature? Literature is news that stays news. It, you don't throw it away. It, it's, you know, so that was, those are the compromises you make. But there are compromises, presumably, for a higher cause, which is art. And art, for many people, especially secular Jews, became the new religion. Yeah. Yes? But even so, is his style very flowery? Or is it very I mean, uh, not, not particularly. You know, he is, despite all the Hasidus, he's still a bit of a Litvak. So he, he's ironic. You know, he often describes things in an ironic way. So even if it's flowery, it's meant to kind of undercut, you know, uh, either the, the person or the place. No, but I wouldn't consider him a highfalutin stylist. No. When you compare the three brothers, yeah. all, you know, Shuel, Daniel, and Baruch, are they more similar stylistically or more dissimilar? Well, I don't think that um, Vladek uh, really wrote that much. He must have written a lot of maybe political... I think editorial. Editorials, which yeah. I'm not that familiar with. Um, I think that um, <clears throat> the two other brothers, uh, Daniel and um, Shmuel, probably have, have a similar style. But Shmuel was a critic, so, you know, critics are often you know, do not write creative. They can at times, you know, yeah. but often they don't, and they have a much more, um, a different style. Criticism is, um, is uh, tends to be more intellectual, and, you know, to have too intellectual a style is also not good for a creative writer, mm -hmm. because uh, uh, an intellectual works with ideas, and an artist works with images. I remember there's a famous line by uh, a British writer who said, don't tell me, show me, show me, is, you know. This is often uh, said uh, to writers by the teachers of literature. Now the teachers of literature has become a whole, teaching of literature has become a whole industry in America. And the first, and, uh, and the cardinal rule is, don't, sh don't tell, show. And what does show mean? You can only show through images, through the visual impulse. Yeah, like, um, uh, you know, Israel singer used to say, "Builders again." Yes, Tell to speak in pictures. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, absolutely. And you know, the, the conflict be, now uh, that we read so much about between Singer and Grada Right. was a Grada, who was a writer from Vilna and was <clears throat> deeply steeped in, in uh, Talmudic study, was a, more intellectual than, than a singer. But that might have been possibly his undoing because, you know, a novelist, you know, if the ideas are too flagrantly obvious, mm -hmm. then the, the work will be a failure. A failure. And, and Grada really was not into Hasidus. He was very much into Musser. You know, he came out of Navardak. Yes, Navardak, yeah, yes. Which is your family. Yeah, yeah. my father was, uh, was born in Navardak, uh, which is in the Belarus today. And, it, and uh, but uh, they. Um, Let me tell people a little, because most people won't know what Navardak yeah, right. means. Yeah, all right. All right, now, Navaradok was a town where the um, modern concept of Musser developed. Musser has always been a tradition in Jewish life. Musser books have been written since the Middle e medieval age. But this was an attempt to create um, character development within Talmudic tradition. Talmudic tradition was always about intellectual excellence and sharpness. And the way you behaved and your character was, you know, it was hoped that if you were intellectually brilliant, everything else would follow. But then uh, a rabbi named Rabbi Salanter in the latter part of the 19th century realized that, that Talmudic uh, students and rabbis uh, in, who were, who, who were developing to become rabbis needed this character development and it was through Musser, which is uh, chastisement oh. of viewing the self the way Puritans did. Mm -hmm. Why did I do this? What was my prompting? Mm -hmm. They were in a sense like Freudians, uh, though they didn't know it and wouldn't you have used that mm -hmm. term, but they wanted to know what their impulses were. If they were humble, why were they humble? Were they humble to be better braggers? You know, what we call today humble brag. You know, when you, you, you seem to be humble, but the, uh, the uh, final uh, purpose of that humility is to be famous or to brag in a better or better way. So um, that was the Musser movement, and it developed in, the, in its most austere and harsh form in Avarada, where um, the test of character was to go into a um, vegetable store and to ask for nails. Why? To humiliate yourself and to show that the self <laughs> needs to be um, chastised and needs to be eventually abolished so the presence of God could be in its place because egoism is what usually yeah. stood between the person and, uh, and uh, the divine. And to narrow the, the self through humiliation and through laughter and through mockery was, was the way to, yeah. to do it. And Navaradak was, was the harshest of them all. In fact, a lot of people felt that it was, it was too, uh, it was almost like monasticism. It was like monks who would beat themselves. It, it didn't even feel Jewish. But they took a good thing, you know, and, and, and rode with it sometimes to, uh, to yes. Okay, I, I think we're reaching the hour, but thank you so much for being here. I hope this was uh, lightning in that way.